Well, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our student political conference today. And we're today talking about why young people's votes matters in our community. To start with, I'd like to thank everybody that sat in our audience for coming today, and I'd like to take a massive uh, thanks to all the panel members for attending as well. From left to right, we'll start with David Hughes, who's a UKIP parliamentary candidate for Bournemouth West. Tobias Dell. <laughs> Got it right first time. <laughs> Bournemouth East. Tobias Elwood, who is actually the Member of Parliament for Bournemouth East for the Conservative Party. Adrian Oliver, who is a potential candidate for, for the Green Party in the constituency of Paul. Claire Moody, who is the uh, South West Labour MEP. Connor Burns, the Member of Parliament for Bournemouth West. Patrick Canavan, the uh, potential Labour candidate for Mid Dorset North Pool. Vicky Slade, the Liberal Democrat candidate for uh, Mid Dorset North Pool. And David Ross, the Independent <laughs> candidate for Bournemouth East. Thank you. Right, let's start with a question. Right, our first question today comes from Daniel Bryant, please. Daniel Bryant. Um, right, so we all obviously know the importance, supposedly, of uh, the youth opinion. Uh, the problem is, though, the youth opinion is largely more left. And in an area such as Dorset and south of England, we've got a primarily conservative and right-wing uh, government in place in, uh, locally. So my question really is, is why do we so, see so little uh, left policy and well opinion from the youth, which is primarily left, uh, actually considered by uh, candidates and people who are in place who are uh, actually more right-wing? So why don't um, more right-wing candidates and uh, people uh, such as the Conservatives who primarily have power in the South um, actually consider these options, like building wind turbines, uh, with a little bit more consideration when there are so many of us which uh, do support green policies. So, yeah. Burns. That's a very good question. Can I separate out two things? The first thing is the difference between candidates who stand on a platform and then become members of parliament. So as a candidate, you have to set out what it is you believe and you have to try and persuade the whole electorate straight, gay, black, white, men, women, of your merits and why you think your arguments are the best ones for your area and your country. And then when you are elected, you have to be, in a sense, above politics and represent everyone, whether they voted for you or didn't vote for you. I have the great privilege of representing the overwhelming majority of Bournemouth University. It's almost entirely in my Bournemouth West constituency, both the campus and where we are today. I spent a lot of time talking to and engaging with students at BU. I do a lot of interviews for young people for their projects. Just before coming here today I met two young journalism students downstairs to be interviewed about of their project on, on A&E. I don't, by the way, also believe in this thing. I think it's patronising to talk about something called the youth vote. Uh, in the same way I think it's patronising to talk about the women's vote or the gay vote. I think we have to appeal to a country and set out our, our vision uh, and our principles. And I think in terms of what the government is doing, I mean, you might call it right wing. I think some of our Liberal Democrat colleagues would profoundly disagree with that, that uh, description of it. But I think for young people, what the government is doing, the current government is doing, in fixing our economy and making sure we have an economy that creates plentiful jobs so that people can graduate into a vibrant labour market to get the means to pay back the fees that you have for attending university, I think those things appeal as much to young people as they do to any other segment of the electorate. Adrian Oliver. Well, I think the question is primarily directed to the other candidates on the panel. Um, we are seeing something different today happening. There's something called the Green Surge. Twen over 20,000 people have joined the Green Party in the last 20 days. Membership today is passing through 60,000. So what that means is there's increasing critical mass locally of people who are supportive of what you might say left-wing or certainly green policies. And you will see in this election a, a full slate of Dorset Green Party candidates for the first time where we haven't stood in four constituencies before and we locally and we haven't stood in Bournemouth East since 1983 as the Ecology Party. So there is now an opportunity for those that have joined and do understand that the way forward is green to get involved and actually get green people elected first at council and then in parliament. So it will come. David Ross. I think there's one thing that's worth making a point about is that um, generally people become more right-wing as they get older. Speaking as a 50-year-old, 58-year-old, I've seen that thing happen to myself. Uh, but also, what 
what happens with democracy is you do elect somebody to run the, the country or the council or whatever, and they've won. So you get what, you've, what the majority uh, has voted for. That's, that's a fact. Of course, it's likely to change because we look like we're going into a more fluid situation, um, and we're likely to have perhaps more coalitions in the future. Um, whether that will make a, a big difference, I don't know, because, of course, one of the problems is that the tail can wag the dog, as we may see at the moment with the current coalition. Um, if you go to places like Israel, the, the tail is wagged very strongly sometimes by very extreme people because you have to form a coalition from a disparate group. Patrick Hanna. I think it's always easier for the governing party to get airtime and um, other candidates really have to struggle to get that kind of coverage. But of course the election is a fantastic opportunity for us to set out the things that we believe in. Um, but one of the things I would just emphasise is don't believe that it's only the Green Party that has green policies, because that's not true. All of the parties have green policies, it's just a question of what those policies are and whether they reflect what you want out of, you know, what you would like to see in terms of renewable energy or, or whatever it is, sustainable energy. The key thing in this election is to try and identify a whole range of issues that interest you, that motivate you, that make you want to go to the polling station to put your little eggs on that bit of paper and find the party that most closely reflects your range of views, not just on green issues, on the environment, but on, on the economy, the NHS, those, all of those things which motivate you. Find the party that most closely reflects your views and vote for them. Tobias Elwood. Well, firstly, thank you for organising this. I think uh, it is an interesting analysis to say that students uh, represent the left or vote left, uh, and therefore you're not necessarily represented here. I was uh, president of my uh, students' union uh, at Loughborough University, uh, which isn't known for its sort of political uh, involvement in, in, in dialogue, but uh, it was the case there that many people from both sides of the, of the, uh, the aisle uh, were involved in politics. It depends how engaging that you want to be. So I, I wouldn't say, and I maybe would take a straw poll here, of how many would vote for the left or how many would vote for the right or one party uh, or another. The fact that we're having this debate is actually very, very good. If you look at the spectrum of engagement in politics, for us as candidates, the youth is actually the hardest to engage with. The interest is perhaps lower than uh, all the other age groups, the highest being actually those who are retired. Perhaps they've got more time, perhaps they're more aware of things. Uh, those who are working obviously are concerned because they're paying taxes uh, and they want a roof over their head, um, they want subsidies, they want uh, the government to represent them. As a student, this is actually the best time of your life in the certain from a fi financial perspective. Now, it may not seem that way right now, but actually you've got a roof over your head your, uh, you've got income coming in, probably not as much as you'd like, but it's coming in from somewhere, and you're studying, and you don't have an awful lot of responsibility. Now, that will all change. And when it does change, that's when people start to engage in the politics around them. And that is, is the challenge that we face, is to actually get uh, the, the, the students uh, to participate in elections. Now, our question to be put is, should we follow Scotland, where they reduce the age to 16? I would worry about that because there might be the sort of wildebeest approach where Justin Bieber says vote one way and suddenly everybody decides to vote that way or somebody else says vote that way rather than thinking about it individually. So there's a responsibility in marking that down. The second point that you made is about wind turbines, which I'd, I'd like to say it would be wrong to say that uh, Connor and I are against wind turbines because we're the Conservative Party and because that's the issue here. We're actually promoting them in, the country, in this country in a way we've not seen before. We start up, started the Green Investment Bank, which is another indication of our commitment to uh, energy and climate change. But you have to ask yourself, if you are putting up turbines, wind turbines in this country, we've got a wonderful uh, shoreline, very windy, you choose where to put it. And the question is whether you put it off the shore of Bournemouth. Because if there's any chance of ruining our biggest industry, which is tourism, then you ask yourself whether it's best placed. And I find it frustrating that there are colleagues in uh, Parliament that want more turbines. The northwest of England, they're calling out for more turbines, offshore ones. And we're saying, actually, please, let's question whether it's right for here. 
So let's actually have more turbines, but let's cite them in the appropriate place in Britain where they are welcomed, not where it could affect an important in industry such as Bournemouth tourism. Vicky Slade. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I can't believe how patronising that was to young people, Tobias. The, the idea that somebody who cares enough to go out and vote at 16 or 17 would A, be interested in Justin Bieber. I mean, my seven-year-old is interested in Justin Bieber, but certainly not my teenager. Um, but I think that's utterly patronising. Um, I also disagree that youth aren't interested in politics. Um, I think I remember when I was um, at school, I didn't go to university, but when I was at school, that was the time I got passionate about issues. And what we have to do is, is take it from people being passionate about an issue and something that matters to them and translating that to saying, that issue has a political basis and turning that into getting them engaged in politics. Um, and I think the biggest issue we've really got is that for too long, politicians and political parties have known that older people will vote. Um, there are some areas where you could, you know, pin a particular colour rosette on a donkey and people of a certain age would probably vote for them. Younger people don't do that. They actually, the number of young people have said to me at the doorstep, I don't know if I'm going to vote because I don't understand it enough. I wish I heard that from people of an older generation. I wish they t actually took that much care about how they vote rather than just do what they've always done and I think we need to think very carefully about making sure that we have policies that young people are engaged in then they will vote if the policies don't matter to young people they won't vote therefore the politicians won't put those policies in their manifestos therefore people won't vote self-fulfilling prophecy so that's really key making sure things that matter to young people are in our manifestos mental health environment, education, those things are critical to young people and, and that's what the tail wagging the dog, i.e. the Liberal Democrats in the government, have been bringing in. Um, so tail wagging the dog and, and patronising, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it's a really important point that you raise. Uh, speaking as a Labour politician for the, the whole of the South West, you, you have some left-wing politicians representing your only, a, a, a one in my, uh, in my job. But uh, I think what we have got is this problem with the, um, the, the engagement of young people in politics and young people not tending to vote, and that's a real issue. It's one of the things why uh, I was really pleased to get the invitation to come here today and sort of talk with yourselves because the outcome of that is you get the policies that we've seen over the last four years. So you've seen the scrapping of the educational maintenance allowance, you've seen the uh, future jobs fund go, you've seen tuition fees get to the stage that they're at now. And all of that, I believe, is, has come through as a consequence of politicians feeling that they're able to ignore young people's issues because young people haven't engaged in the ballot box. Uh, and I, I think that's fundamentally wrong. <laughs> and I think there's a responsibility on us to try and engage you much more. So that, you know, but I also think that's, there's a vicious spiral effect on that as well. Um, however, I am very happy to say that I am very supportive of the Navitas Bay development. Uh, the, you know, so the issues around environment, uh, I, as an MEP, part of my work in the European Parliament is on uh, is through a committee. It's an environment. It's got the environment and energy as part of its remit, and I have actually been doing quite a lot of work in that area, which has been supporting renewable technologies and green industry. And I see yeah, the Navitas Bay development nine miles off the Dorset coast uh, as being part and parcel of uh, that important agenda that I can support both locally but actually through my work as you know, kind of your Labour <laughs> elected representative as well. David Hughes. Your, your question really makes out uh, the, the case for people, all people really, uh, we're at a university, Hastings, here this afternoon, so we tend to address ourselves uh, to, to, to younger people of student age. And your question really makes out the case uh, for engagement in politics. And, and if you're really sort of passionate on the sort of, um, the, uh, of, of the, your, your own political ideology, then you need to do perhaps more than just go to, uh, to vote 
on polling day, but, but associate yourself and identify yourself with those groupings that represent the view, the ideology, the, the, the world view that you want to present. I mean, one of the essentials of a democracy is that it is a bottom-up element. It should not be a top-down. And one of, uh, one of my great concerns is that we're seeing in this day and in this age a greater move towards centralization, uh, which means a detachment from people in general, and we begin to see a top-down uh, kind of uh, form of government. And uh, th this is anti-democratic, it's not good for us as a country, and we need to see people getting more engaged. Um, uh, wh whether, your, whether your view is left-wing or whether your view is right-wing, uh, to me, y y you, have, um, y you have a right to your own view. Nobody contradicts that uh, at all. But what I do support is the right for people to be heard and to make their influence known to address what is now referred to as the democratic deficit that is happening now in this country. <coughs> so yeah, I like the question and it, what it's saying to me is young people, as I'm, we're addressing young people here, uh, get passionate about the subject and get involved uh, with those political parties that most identify with where you stand and where you're coming from. Okay, well, being a question time style of debate, let's have some questions from the audience, please. The lady over there. Hi. Um, <laughs> mostly just a question for uh, Mr. Ross over there. Hello. Just a few things. Uh, the, you made a point earlier about having um, sort, of, sort of you got more right wing as you got older, very different way. Uh, firstly, would you say that you got more right wing or that the things that were once considered uh, left wing in your youth are now considered right wing now because of the shift in society? And secondly, if not, why do you think that um, older people vote differently from younger people? Uh, why would you make that shift as you um, got older, basically? Right. Um, well, of course, the whole nature of politics has changed because the issues that we used to talk about in the past, m many of them aren't here. For instance, uh, we never talk about the, um, the balance of payments problem anymore because, unfortunately, it's so bad that we wouldn't like to talk about it. Um, those of us you know, laughs from the older people who remember that one. Um, I think um, fundamentally you get a bit more right wing as you get older because you become quite more practical. I think Tobias made a fair point about that, that, um, that as you have responsibilities, and I'm a person who for the last 30 years has had to feed his family through his own efforts, no public job, I was in a, a public job for the first nine years with the tax office, um, that makes, makes you very feel very practical. You want solutions, you want things that work. And uh, whilst you sympathise with people who, who tend to, be, the left tends to be quite idealistic. Um, I think less practical. And I like to think, I, I, I quite like to laugh when uh, things go wrong that were the unintended consequences of left-wing policies. Um, for instance, devolution. Um, I think the Labour Party supported devolution, thinking they'll do well out of that because all the Scots vote uh, uh, Labour. And look what's happened to them. The Scots have decided to abandon Labour and go to the SNP. And now they're really worried about it because they realise that in the next parliament we might have a big, mighty Scots army come down. And Labour could never have uh, a, a, a majority on their own without having to deal with Alex Salmon, who's yeah. one of the most wily politicians out. So. Uh, we'll hear the views of the gentleman in the blue at the back there. Tobias, you talk about how you used to be the Student Union President at Loughborough University. I'm currently the Student Union President at the Arts University in Bournemouth. I find it quite shocking to hear that you say that students don't have much responsibility and I kind of find that quite surprising to say that where you actually came from and the position that you actually held. I'd like you to see you do a day in my shoes and tell me that my students don't have responsibilities. No, I, if, I, if I may put that into context, it wasn't meant, and, and you know, Vicky, I'm sorry you chose the words that you did, it was, wasn't designed to be patronising. I, 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 if I may, absolutely, absolutely. And this is what this debate is all about. And I'll, I'll this is a debate for young people, and if you want young people's votes, then maybe you should start listening to them, and maybe you should start valuing their opinions. Um, can I come back? Yes. Thank you. The, it, 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 the important point to say is to spell out the challenge that, it, that all MPs, in fact, society faces in engaging with young people and getting people to actually vote. And as I say, I think 
Vicky's comments, I think, were, you know, I wasn't designed, wasn't wanting to be any more patronizing than her comment about older people voting for a donkey with a particular label on it, which I also thought was a bit peculiar. The point, though, is, is when I said this true. about responsibility, if, in responsibility uh, in, in life, is that uh, on reflection in a period, in any person's life, the period that you are as a student is a very, very interesting one in that, and perhaps it's, it draws to your question, that maybe you are drawn to more left-wing policies because you are facing a different set of challenges and a different set of responsibilities. Maybe put it that way. It is different from when, let's say, you have a family or you have children and so forth. And what tends to happen is as you move from being a student where you're looking ahead and progressing, there will come a point whereby you will collect more responsibility through family, through work, through responsibility for work people as well as you progress up. That's what I was painting a picture at. Certainly it was no intention to suggest that, that, that students have no responsibility at all. That's wrong. You feel the weight of the world on your shoulders right now, not least to pass exams, particularly in the, the, uh, comp the competitive world that we're actually in uh, at the moment. But I go back to the point that there's a challenge that we face. I, d I would disagree um, uh, with the comment that was made to say you need to join parties. I actually think it's, it's the point, you, you mentioned the point about wind farms and so forth. I think the younger generation, and indeed all politics, the numbers of members of party, uh, in parties is reducing. And people are now coming forward because they care about an issue. They care about one particular issue. Apart from the Green Party is doing well, well, absolutely. <laughs> um, but from a low base. But the point, though, is, is that the, uh, the, the point, though, is that there are individual um, areas of concern that people are rallying around. And the best example of that was in Scotland, whereby people weren't necessarily wanting to join a party for that, but they were concerned about where their country was going. They were concerned about whether they're going to be part of, of the union or whether it's going to go in, in, uh, on their own. And I think that's where people will then latch themselves to support a party because of a particular issue, rather than necessarily because they believe in the party as a whole, because views right across the board change so dramatically. So we saw something happen, and it, and it may well have started with the Scottish referendum. Younger people did have the vote at 16. It's Green Party policy that that be the case more widely. And there's much more, there was a great in, engagement with young people as well as the whole people, you know, lots of people in Scotland, 85% or something voting. But the issue there was a very simple thing. Everybody had a vote and it mattered. We have a voting system that controls through fear. One party says, vote for us or you'll get something worse. We need to change that so that you can actually vote for what you want. In many constituencies, including probably around here, there are safe seats. And actually, which way you vote doesn't matter. You don't get the representation you, you want. The Green Party's policy would change that to proportional representation so that actually you can express the vote and get the representation that you want, as we did in the European elections last time. We now have, for the first time, a Green MEP in the Southwest. In relation to the second question, they're probably related. We've seen there's another issue about why people are not voting and possibly young people in that we have now the four parties, other parties represented here, all support the same neoliberal economic agenda, which is corporate driven, is market led and doesn't resolve the issues like housing now. We've known we've needed houses built for decades. They haven't fixed it. Has the market fixed it? No. The market's interested in building luxury homes with big profit margins. Government is an opportunity to do something to improve the quality of life for all. These parties have abdicated that responsibility in favour of the market. The Green Party will put people before the planet and pro people and the planet before profit. That will make a difference to your engagement. I had some things to say about um, all of that. Please make it brief. Would you have why don't we let them have more say? We're, we're dominating this thing, and yeah. really these guys should have say, more. No, do you want me to throw the question out say. first? And then we'll throw the question out first, yes. and then I'll come back to make sure I get there is, say. there is, in my eyes, a major reason as to why parties such as the Green Party and UKIP are doing so well, especially in the young vote. And that reason, I feel, has just been exemplified pretty well. With the comment that what I believe was intended as a joke regarding Justin Bieber, which was I'm then... I'm actually quoting another student. I'm okay. sorry yeah. that we got hung up on this. But another However, student came back to say, yeah. we had a vote at a school I went to, just in God's name, if I may. And I said, would you like to have the vote at, 18, uh, at 16, reduced to 16? And the actual majority, two-thirds, said, no, we didn't want to. And I said, why? 
and they placed the concern that actually they didn't know enough about the system at 16, and they would be worried that there would be personalities, of for which this is one, which I now hugely regret even mentioning, <laughs> Um, to, who might lead and say sort of things, uh, I, I say sort of things on, on, and then sway the vote. I, that was the concern. I'd be interested to take a vote. Maybe we could do that well, on, whether the, on that particular issue to go to 16 to 18. Yeah. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's I, quite I, I, I agree with you know, the argument made there. But then the problem that's represented in the political system, the response then given by the Liberal Democrat candidate, was quite frankly offensive. That people who are old will vote the exact quote in a rosette on a donkey and old people will vote for it. My parents are old. They do not vote for donkeys, they vote for people. That is offensive. May I interject? You watch Prime Minister's questions and all you get is David Cameron and Ed Miliband frankly insulting each other. It's like watching a year nine fight outside the canteen. Isn't it? Isn't it, maybe it's a bit more educated than who has the best toy tractor, but to be honest, it's not much different. Isn't it time, and would the candidates here agree, that the biggest surge in the youth support of UKIP and the Greens is because the Greens, especially, I don't agree with the Greens, but I do agree with the fact that they spend less time fighting with each other and more time listening to the people that are voting for them. Would the people here agree that, that something has to be done to focus instead on what the people want and not between arguing between people shouting at each other across two benches in an incredibly old building. We need to actually listen to what the voters want and then you're going to get voting engagement up. May I defend that point about pinning the rosette? Well, Patrick had something to say to start with, but I would like to throw it to the audience because we have got a fair amount of hands up. So if you would make it brief, that would be appreciated. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you are absolutely right. You know, it's a challenge for all of us. Who, who seek to do this to try and um, represent not not just your views, but also to ask <laughs> what your views are. And it's not just about us setting out our stall and you know trying to win you over to our side. It's about us saying, well, you know, we we say all this stuff, and there'll be loads of it. But actually, what do you want? When you've um, Probably so at some stage you've probably had, you know, you do, you do these interview questions in preparation for jobs. One of the stock questions is, well, where do you see yourself in five years' time? The same is true in a general election. What sort of country do you want to see in five years' time? And it's up to you to tell us. And we have to ask you, we have to involve you more. And that's what's so important about devolution. Not we weren't doing it because we thought we were going to win something out of it. We were doing it because it actually matters. Because moving power closer to where decisions actually affect people is intrinsically important. You have to move power away from the centre, away from Westminster, more closer to where those decisions actually affect people. So we've got to get away from the top down and start engaging people and allowing people empowering people, enabling people to make those kind of decisions for themselves. And that will change politics fundamentally. So right. interject, please, on the, on the aid please, the please make it brief. We do have a fair yeah, amount of hands. Aid has been pinned questions. to the donkey along with the rosette by mistake. But it is true. Historically, some of the laziest MPs in Parliament have been from the, the north-east of England who are Labour. And I'm sorry. Once, oh, just sorry. truly, because they know they're in a job for life, no, because they'll only get not because old, old people vote <laughs> yeah. for them, but because historic it's a Labour area, and so in the south we're a Conservative area. It's sorry, it's a fact. It's ridiculous. It's a fact of life. To the gentleman in the white there. Well, firstly, the point about that young people are more left wing. I find that interesting, given the Conservative Party actually has the largest youth wing. Um, so perhaps in this room they're more left-wing, but if you look at the bigger picture, that's not necessarily true. Um, and also on the fact, the reason is that and young people have become disengaged in politics, as, have, as has everyone, because the party's all at the same. You've got Nick Clegg, David Cameron and Ed Miliband, all three career politicians, and we need, I, I think the adversarial politics of the 1980s was brilliant, because you had a clear choice whether you, there was a fundamental difference as to whether you've got a Conservative government or a Labour government and that is not the case anymore and I think, I, I, however, it may come back with Ed Miliband moving to the left and um, hopefully the Tories moving back to the right 
will have a good divide and we can you know, get back into proper politics again rather than personalities and a lack of political convictions. Right, well, we've got two hands up at the moment. We'll take the ladies' point over there. We've got one over there as well. I do think it's quite funny for the Lib Dems to come here and say we care about young people when you uh, went back on your promise to raise tuition fees in this, um, this thing. And also, for the Conservatives MPs, I feel... I take your point that they have the larger youth wing, but all you've done this election is change your education, which led to some people not getting into uni, you cut the EMA, and you went, you forced the Liberal Democrats to uh, raise their tuition fees in the first place, which you weren't even taking responsibility for. So, you know, I understand it's both of you to blame with the Liberal Democrats. I think in this election, you really need to stamp you need to give it a good stand to the youth, you need to put it on the front page of your manifesto and then you can get voters back. But the Conservatives need to take responsibility for the tuition fees as well because you were the party who fought Nick Clare to go, go back on that promise. We'll hear from Nick as well. Thank you. I, I think that's really important. And, I, and clearly Nick has apologised for, for that grave error of judgement. And no, it, it doesn't make it OK. It, that doesn't make it OK, Tobias. But what it does mean is that he's accepted the responsibility for that. And actually, you have to be, be really sort of straight with it and say, the manifesto that was written in 2010 was written on the basis of a Lib Dem government. We didn't get a Lib Dem government. We didn't know we were going into a coalition. Now, clearly, in my mind, what should have happened is there should have been, it would have been a good idea to publicly be more honest about what was being negotiated behind the scenes. But we, we failed to get that part of our manifesto put into law. We have achieved 70% of what was in our manifesto, including the four key points, including a vote on changing the voting system, which, well, it was the best what the Conservatives would give us. You know, we would have liked to have the full proportional representation. We weren't able to get it. We went for a referendum. The people said no. But I think you are absolutely right. You know, Annette Brook, our local um, Lib Dem MP, voted against the tuition fee increase. You know, she, she signed the pledge and she wasn't prepared to go back on it. That was a huge mistake, but it was a price that we had to pay in order to keep the country stable, to not actually bring the government down. But what I would say is when we went into government, there was, um, it was, we now have more underprivileged children going into university. It, you're now 2.5 times less likely to go into university if you're from an underprivileged background. It used to be 4.5 times. So it is moving in the right direction. The, inc the amount you have to, the, the income you have to have before you start paying has gone up substantially. So your actual payback, and you've got no money to pay up front. So some people are accepting that no, it's not an ideal situation, but it, it was a decision that we had to take. But you are right, it's a joint responsibility, and we're the only people that have been punished for it. Yeah, before, you I, I agree. before you reply to the last, is there any more questions from the audience on this <laughs> subject matter before we move on? We let to buy here and then we'll hear you. I think the education <laughs> is, is a, a very, very tough one. And it fits into to the, the, the world that we now live in. We inherited, when we came into to, to office, uh, the worst deficit and the worst debt that this country has ever come across. Well, I mean, that is a reality check. We can, we can ignore that at our peril. And the reason why we are now more competitive and the reason why Britain is the, the fastest growing country, not just in the G7, but in Europe as well, it's because we've had to actually take tough decisions. Tough decisions in defence, tough decisions in local government, and yes, tough decisions in education as well. Now, I'll say that when I went to university, it only, I think, five or six percent of school leavers went to university. Today, it's about 50 percent. Half of all school leavers will go to university. And the question is, how is that then paid for? The government must meet, you know, make, make ends meet. And the tough decision was to say, Let's have a loan system which allows you to actually do your studies and then pay it back in actually due, due course. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that anybody's been denied uh, university. That was never the case. And if there is a, a situation such, such as that, please, please let me know about it because the whole system was designed to be able to pay back at a rate which you can actually uh, afford. But I would say that with the number, number of apprenticeships that we're creating and the number of university places that we're creating, 
We can only have the best economy if we have the best graduates and the best workers and the best school leavers. We are achieving that because of the rigorousness in which we've improved British education. It is now better than the rest of Europe. We are doing far, far better than we were five years ago. And that's actually a tribute to the universities and to the schools as well. I, I mean, you, you sigh, but as I say, it's reflected in the economic outlook. If we want jobs in this country, we have to have an economy which is allowing businesses to actually flourish. And we've created over one and a half million private sector jobs, and we've reduced the size of the public sector. This is actually good, and it's putting Britain on the road to recovery. I just think it's a shame that you target the totally youth instead of the old people who, you, by the way, you tripled lots of pensions, and also we, free university fees in Scotland. You're still paying for that, so is that really fair? Well, the, <laughs> Scotland, Scotland have their own system, so uh, and and it's a four-year degree course, I think, there as well. Um, but they, it's a devolved matter, so they they choose their own their own system. But are you suggesting that somehow we should tax the uh, older people? Is that what you're saying? Yes, because okay. it's like the Esther Ranch Vanston was on the TV saying, "I don't want to." Um, take my winter fuel allowance this um, no, year because I, okay, you know, I can afford amount. it that, myself. That's a good example. Why, does, why do people who can afford it get the winter fuel exactly. allowance? Why do people in Spain who are expats get the winter fuel allowance? These are things that we've inherited and they absolutely, they have to change. They're absolutely, absolutely daft. I also see we have a lot of hands going up. We must eventually move on because we do have two more questions. So if you'd like to make your point, please make it very brief. And I'll take one or two more points from the audience. I will definitely make Yes, absolutely. I'll make it as brief as I can. On the point on universities, I'm deeply worried about the funding for universities. They're actually hugely dependent on European Union funding right now because of the changes, the structural changes that have happened to uh, university funding. I think going back to the point which I haven't had a chance to respond to yet, which was the one about... Uh, the experience of students now. I know, I mean, I, I went to university as a, what's laughingly called a material student. I already had my son by then, so it was a different kind of experience. But what I know from people who went to university uh, who are my age and watching my son go through university, the difference in responsibilities and kind of uh, focus that you know, my son had when he went through university, I think very much reflects your point that uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing being a student right now as well. Um, the final thing, I just have to come back on some of what Tobias said. First of all, the economy was in growth in 2010. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, the issue that I really wanted to uh, raise as well is actually people's experiences of what you call success, your version of success because the experiences of people who are on the receiving end of this government's policies are that people who are under 25, there has been a 9% reduction in the, the wages that those people can expect to earn since 2010. And I'm really not sure that you can say Gove has been a good thing for the education system in this country over the last four years either. Except we'll he's take, not I'll there take two more points because we really have to move on. The lady in the, the back. Um, you say uh, you've increased the Conservative Party have increased jobs. Could you say this is because there's been an increase in zero hour contracts, which actually takes advantage of people who already don't have enough money as it is? You know, they might not have work some week. How is that a success? <coughs> yes, please make it brief. Certainly, um, the zero hours contracts have come up. It's something we inherited, in fact, from, from Labour. Uh, and I think a bill is going through. <laughs> Well, that, that is a reality. Um, but firstly, the number of people in work, we have never had such high employment uh, as we actually have now. There is a record number of people in work, and that must be a good thing. That must be celebrated. However, there will always be, be people, because of the toughness and the tough decisions that have been made, that we need to look at. And the zero hours contracts, I think there's a bill going through Parliament as we speak. We'll have one more, we'll have one more point, and then we must move on. Gentlemen. Very quickly, it seems the majority of jeering and snide comments coming from the audience are not coming from the students, they're coming from the adults representing their political parties, and this is a student conference. So if a student can make a point without being jeered at, that would be wonderful. Um, with regards to the increase in tuition fees, I'm being very open, it's a student conference. If, with regards to the increase in tuition fees, the blame has been placed on the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, but I think we should all remember who introduced tuition fees in the first place, the Labour Party. 
the Labour Party who introduced them to 1,000, then to 3,000, then to, I believe, 3,890 pounds. The Labour Party who, when the Brown Review was released, John Durham said that students should contribute to their education. And now the Labour Party are saying we should just get rid of them and bring it down to a free education. And also Vince Cable, who said the Brown Review, I know he's a Liberal Democrat, the Brown Review was published along the right lines. Every major party approved tuition fees. And now every major party is backing out of it, or with the exception of the Conservatives, they are backing out of it in an attempt to garner youth support. Are the parties interested in the youth vote or youth ideas? Very quickly, because well, I've, said, I've said very little. Please feed quick. Can, can I just say, I remember before the last general election sitting in a room on the Talbot campus and the question of tuition fees came up and the report that had been commissioned by the then Labour government hadn't been published. And I sat there as my competitor candidates for the job as Member of Parliament Bournemouth West made <laughs> grandiose promises about what they would do on that. And I was greeted in stony silence when I said I would wait for the review and the evidence and how we could get more money into the university system. It was greeted in stony silence. I was given a very good piece of advice very early on when I wanted to go into politics and that in politics it is much more important to be respected than it is to be liked. And on the basis of the evidence that was put forward, I did go through the lobby and I voted for tuition fees. And I think on the panel today, I am the one who has the most undergraduates in my parliamentary constituency in the coming general election. And I will stand by what I did because I believe it was the right thing to do to, to create a sustainable, long-term, vibrant higher education system in this country. And I stood up and I put the case to David Willits as the bill was going through Parliament that we must amend the bill to ensure that the rate at which people repaid those fees when they went, to in, went into work rose in terms of average earnings or inflation. That was put into the bill. We then ended upfront fees so people only pay at the end. I think it was the right thing to do. It may not have been the most popular thing to do. And can I just conclude by saying this? I do believe in votes for 16-year-olds. I believe in bringing them in alongside compulsory education about politics and civic life and governance in this country because I believe young people if they engage at an early stage with politics and are confronted with the decisions that we have to take in Parliament will engage with that and will become better citizens through their lifetime. I trust young people. One of the things I quote most often is a lecture given by J.M. Barry who only made one public speech in his life, actually something many of my colleagues could take some inspiration from. And he spoke to the undergraduates of St Andrews University in 1922 in the aftermath of the First World War where a generation had been obliterated. And he said that it was the task for young people to rise up and demand an equality of decision making, a partnership with their elders, because they had further to go by definition than we have. And the decisions we take in national life today will have much more impact on your life than they do ours. And I think J.M. Barry's words are as relevant today as they were in 1922. Thank you. Right, let's move on to the next question. And the question has come from Kirsty Bradbury, please. Okay, so my question is on education, and the point is that we are being taught to the test. We are not learning anything in terms of life skills. We don't know how to open a bank account. We don't know about politics, and like we don't know how to pay bills or what bills, like council tax. We don't know anything about that. We don't know about self, how to do self-employment. We don't know about employment rights. No, we are just like saying, here's an English paper, here's a maths paper. Do A plus B equals A B. What has that got to do with, I've learnt nothing, I've got 14 GCSEs plus two BTECs at secondary school level. I know nothing, I remember nothing, it's only like two years ago. And like my point is as well, you're pushing 50% of people to university, which is Mickey Mouse degrees like football studies. We do not need football studies, what is that going to do for our economy? Well, who wants to first take that? Tobias? I couldn't agree more. I, it's golf studies that the one that got me, but football studies is just as bad. And we're now actually seeing many people, because of, of, of pressure, this goes back to the, the, the question earlier, because of the, the, the pressure to earn, actually choosing not to go to university, but to do other courses which allow them to pursue a, a, a career, but also not to spend four years doing that, and maybe to return as a mature student later. But you make a very important point about life skills. And there's something called the National Citizen Service, which has uh, started up 
I just want to, could I just see a show of hands? Has anybody done the National Citizen Service in Bournemouth? Did you find that helpful and interesting and give you confidence? And I think perhaps that needs to be um, enhanced to talk about some of the aspects. That's more about you know, personal growth, understanding, building your confidence, these very skills, which are absolutely right. A university degree or three or four A-levels and so forth won't indeed actually focus upon. So that is something that I was personally involved in in setting up um, because it was based a little bit on the military experience of the national service, but something obviously for, for civilians. It's now being rolled out not just as a sort of volunteer program, but as something that can happen right across, across the board. Uh, but you're absolutely right. If we are wanting people to flourish in life, they not only have to be academically strong, but they also have to have, to have the life skills as well. Like people do vocation because like are you gonna get hairdressers saying, Oh, here's an exam, like what's the equation to make someone bold? I I completely and utterly agree with you. I, I visited a school in our constituency about six months ago where the young people were it was a PE lesson and they were learning about badminton and I looked around and I said, But you're in a classroom. And they said, oh yeah, we, we don't actually learn it outside anymore. Um, we actually learn it on paper. And I thought, oh, the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen, because the best way to learn badminton is with a shuttlecock and outside, you know, hitting it around. So there has been a huge shift, which I think is a really negative one. Obviously, the move towards apprenticeships being taken seriously and being quality apprenticeships, there's no point them all being the very base level apprenticeships, at, you know, £2.65 an hour. But there is, there is a need to have apprenticeships at all levels. Um, the Labour Party talked about getting rid of MVQ2 level apprenticeships and I think that would be really, really dangerous. I've taken on five or six apprentices in my own business and one of them had come from school, no self-esteem at all, she would never have been taken on to a higher level course. We gave her the grounding, she's then gone on to a really reputable, high quality national you know, chain of, of, of hotels to take the next step up and I think that's really important. But there's there's two two lo two things going on locally which I think are um, are very important for young people. One is the UK UK Youth Parliament, which I don't believe Bournemouth ha accesses at the moment. It does. We, does it? It is a vibrant operation. Okay. Well, we. Okay. Well, we. It wasn't apparent at the last event we had, but next week we, in Paul we've got the UK Youth Elections, um, and one of the the. Um, policies which they've brought in across the country is the curriculum for life and it does exactly what you've said and the other one is young enterprise which I've volunteered for five or six years which takes young people either at 13 or at 15 or at 17 and works with them throughout an academic year to actually look at everything that they need to have the employability skills to go forward and that's really where we need to focus to make sure that alongside the academic qualifications that are really important you leave school being able to have the life skills for a 21st century life. We well, haven't heard much from David Hughes. Do you have anything to add? Well, 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 yes, I do. Uh, as far as education is concerned, and the question that you've posed, uh, one of my reservations is the way that the school inspectorate works and Ofsted uh, inspections and the whole regime uh, of testing success of schools uh, <laughs> by, by, by the, the regime of targets. And I think this has had a... a a negative effect on providing an all-round uh, education. My, my daughter uh, is a primary school teacher uh, and, and when the notice comes up of an Ofsted inspection, uh, th they literally freak out nowadays. They are, uh, you know, they, they, teachers get d d depressed, they, 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 they have to sort of uh, uh, meet very rigorous targets. Um, and what tends to happen is to uh, is to run education on a target basis um, format in order just to get past these Ofsted inspections. Of course, once the inspection's done, there's a huge sigh of, of, of re relief and just dread the next one that comes along. I don't think that a good uh, all-round education can fit into that format, into that mould. I, uh, uh, I think we should trust uh, school authorities more to, to provide the education that, te that, that, that children, that students and pupils need. 
Um, they do a terrific job. They have a huge responsibility. And, and overall, um, they take their jobs very seriously and they are devoted and dedicated professionals. If those pressures of targets are just taken off, we have to have some form of inspector, otherwise you would get uh, bad schools getting worse. There has to be something, but I think it would, would be better done on a, a non-centralised basis. I used to think that the county system that we used to have worked far better for an all-round education uh, and free up teachers to educate their pupils in a more rounded education that would include the sort of areas that you're talking about. When I first told my uh, daughter, so 15 or so years ago, when, when I first stood as a candidate, she, uh, she's a teacher. She, she herself had no idea of <coughs> what was involved in standing as a candidate. She didn't have a clue, and yet she was a, she, she was a teacher because she herself had never had that sort of citizenship instruction. So I'm saying, look, let's back off on the Ofsted system. We, that needs reviewing. This is more of a personal view than a, than a UKIP policy, is my view, but we need to come back from that and let teachers do the teaching in the way that they think best because they are the professionals at the end of the day. Right, we'll hear from David Ross, and we've only got about 10 minutes left, so we must hurry up on this one. So yes, please thank make you for your question, through. which invites me to take my life in my hands and talk about education to a bunch of students. Um, I could go on all day, but um, I think there's one thing that's bear, worth bearing in mind that is one of the daft targets that we have is 50% of people going through uh, university education. It seems to be mad. Half the population. And, and how has it been achieved? Well, actually, by converting a lot of other institutions into universities. And I really do take my life in hands that I remember this institution has had be, having been the Dorset Institution of Higher Education, then it became a polytechnic and now it's become a university. So the way that these targets have been achieved is by changing the names of the institutions and of course allowing them to confer degrees. Um, and I could go on all day about apprenticeships, I just wish my 19 year old son, who I am still supporting, had been able to start an apprenticeship at 14 as in the old days, because he would now be a fully time served tradesman if he wanted to be at the age of 19, entering the world on a full wage. And I would, I would have supported him in the same way as I have. And yet the unions said you can't pay young people too little and they ruined the, uh, the, the apprenticeship system that, that way. And what do we have? Young people earning low wages. Are you implying that there um, shouldn't be a minimum wage for young people and you can just pay them whatever you want or did I misinterpret that? There, is a, there was an exchange between training and um, that income. The exchange was that people essentially lived with their parents while they were training. If you ask employers, it's very expensive and troublesome actually to train tradesmen, etc. So the exchange was between the, uh, the, the training that a person got. Remember, 19 is, is quite a young person. You can't leave school now until you're 18. So we're talking about the same thing. Coming out a fully fledged adult uh, with um, a carpentry or electrician's proper time served city and guilds qualification. Nowadays, you'd earn a lot of money. Plumbers can make 60000 a year. What's wrong with that? Instead of which, we've got people entering uh, work. Apprenticeships. Uh, one of my children has a friend uh, doing a, a, a next, a, uh, sorry, a next, yes, a, a, a retail apprenticeship. What is a, a retail apprenticeship? Learning to be a shop assistant. And, she, and, and as a result, she gets £1.50 an hour or something because she's on the apprentice rate. That's not an apprenticeship. Thank you. Yeah, I... I spent most of my adult life in the trade union movement, so uh, I think I'm slightly better informed to be able to deal with that particular point. And trade unions have, have spent, you know, it has been core of the work of trade unions, a apprenticeships in workplaces. But also another point that I was going to come on to in response to your question, by the way, congratulations on 14 GCSEs. That actually sounds genuinely impressive. But, Right. <laughs> but the, the point I was going to make, again, sort of following up on the trade union point, is also education shouldn't stop at 21 or 18 or you know, when people leave an educational institution. It is vital that you have you know, what's kind of termed lifelong learning. So, and again, that is something that trade unions, trade unions have learner reps that have been instrumental in supporting through workplaces. Uh, and you know, I think it is essential that people can continue to learn while they're working as well so you know it is uh, it is a big big part of it. I just had to come back on that point about apprenticeships. Yes, absolutely fine. Has anyone got any other questions? Lady in the green over there. Um, 
Uh, regarding education, as the young lady was saying, please can we have a climate literacy program as our ecosystems collapse? Thank you. Look, schools should be there to provide people <coughs> with the knowledge to get into the jobs market, to get good jobs and to stand on their own two feet. But that is not the sole responsibility of education. It's interesting how the, the answers deviated from the really good question that you ask, because so many of the challenges you encounter when people come to see you as a constituency member of parliament are people who have run into problems managing household budgets, getting into debt, often going to doorstep lenders, not being aware of other things that are available to them in the form of credit unions, um, things we're doing to put more pressure and responsibility onto banks to provide bank accounts to those who in the past would have been absolutely turned away, actually in response to the government, which is you the taxpayer, Britain the taxpayer, stepping in to rescue them from their folly. I, one of my great passions is, is cooking and I really regret that that has diminished in schools. I wouldn't let someone really leave school until they understood how to cook good quality nutritious meals from basic ingredients. And one of the things I really despair of often going around the supermarket is seeing um, young parents loading up the trolleys with processed foods to go into the freezer and then into the microwave. Uh, and I think that actually then feeds on to lots of other problems that in due course put extra burdens on the, the National Health Service and so on. So your point, I think, goes absolutely central to what politicians need in the next phase of looking at what we do in education to put those life skills alongside and in conjunction with academic and vocational learning. Right, well, we have two minutes left. Does anyone want, in the audience want to make a final point? Gentleman at the back, then. Uh, yeah, just about what you just said. Um, my mother is disabled, and so therefore her money, she gets all her money from the government, albeit not much of it. Um, do you think that if you want the NHS to have less pressure from uh, people eating processed foods, that then people with benefits should be able to afford healthier foods? Yeah. Like, my mum eats constantly processed food. That's all she can afford. So, like, how can we take the weight off the NHS if we're not feeding the country properly? Can I take it away from the individual circumstance? Because there's a real danger if I respond about your mum and I don't know anything about her circumstances, what she does, that you could correctly uh, take grave offence. But there's been a lot of work done that has demonstrated that if people take the money that is available through benefits and other things and spend that money on fresh ingredients that they can actually make that money go further than processed foods can. I, this is not genuinely not targeted in any way at your mum. But you know, the, Jamie Oliver, who, who can be a bit of a pain in the neck, um, he's done some actually really interesting work around the, the schools uh, meals programs and, and getting nutritious meals into them. One of the things I actually regret about our academies program is that we don't put the same obligation on academies as we do on other uh, state funded schools to provide good quality nutritious meals uh, to, to young people when they're at school. But I, I think that you can actually eat really quite well on good quality fresh ingredients rather than on processed food. And at the mis risk of really throwing a match onto gunpowder at the end of this, um, I do notice quite often when you go around uh, and you see a lot of people who are on in receipt of benefits. Now, this is their choice, okay? This is the choice that everybody as individual citizens has absolutely the right to make in a free society. But you quite often see people pushing children and they're smoking. Now, I used to smoke a packet of cigarettes and now about nine quid. That's a hell of a dent in a, in a benefit check on a weekly or a monthly basis, isn't it? Right, anyway, I'm going to have to stop here, the regular question time, because we've run out of time. But now we're going to go into the reverse question time, whereby the panel members here ask you questions and you reply in <coughs> to whatever you believe is appropriate. So does anyone on the panel have a question for our audience members? Could we pick up that one? Tobias's point about asking for on votes for 16. Yeah. Well, if, if you'd like to ask that question, then yeah. you certainly can ask it. Yeah. Let's, let's pose that question yeah. on, on the, um, the age group. Would you like to reduce the age of voting from 18 to 16? If you're in favour of that, please put up your hand. Okay. And if, thank you, if you're against it, put up your hand. And if you really couldn't care less, put up your hand. You couldn't even care to put up your hand in that case. Okay. The, so it, I think it's in favour of that, that, that audience there, it was moderately in favour, but it's, it's not quite as clear cut. In favour of another Green Party policy, just like nationalising the, the railways, etc. All very popular. You've got, to, you've got a point at the back. Lady at the back, yeah. Lady at the back. You can't just ask that question because if you're going to put some education in, in place for the younger people, then 
you should be young for 16 year olds but if you're not going to do anything then definitely not because they don't know anything so if those classes put put in then yeah but if not Can then there's no point you guys a really fundamental question so we hear all the time that young people aren't political that's not my experience i find people are issue political they're very concerned about you know the state of the economy jobs environment and so on what is it it's who here doesn't like party politics thinks we're all the same and right well you, you kick off what is it about what is it about party politics and the party system that you find disengages you? Um, but to, <laughs> to go on forever, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we've only got about Twenty minutes. The issue is that everyone just seems to name call and shout at each other, and it's someone else's fault, and then it's his fault, and it's her fault. Or well, Labour did this, and well, we're doing this, and we reduced the deficit by that. But are real issues being dealt with? I mean. I'm a postgraduate at Bournemouth Uni. I'm studying a thing called Green Economy, which looks at sustainable development. And that can be to do with the environment, that can be to do with your economy, it can be uh, to do with communities. So the point I want to make is that if we're so caught up on issues, as you've discussed, are we dealing with the wider issues that are actually probably more the causing factors with the things we've been talking about? Because from my understanding, debt just seems to grow, and it's a game of musical chairs. And we're trying to, I mean, you can talk about deficits being reduced, but at the same time, is that, it, 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 have I felt that? Has, you know, anyone who works in the NHS felt that? Probably not. And it just seems to be that, I don't know, we, we just seem to shout each other about really small, specific issues, but really are we dealing with the wider things? Like, for instance, the fact that we're on a perpetual debt system on a finite planet. That can't work. It doesn't work. It's not working. That's why uh, every ecosystem in the world is currently dying. Um, you know, every fishery is at extor exhaustion because of the system we run. It doesn't represent the world, it represents a political sphere. And that is why people become disillusioned with the idea of, you know, you saying this, oh, but now he's saying that. And um, it's very easy for someone to get a motive and feel like, oh, well, that actually, I, I can identify that policy. I'll vote for that party. But is that really truly dealing with all the issues uh, that we actually face as a, as a race? Because I think a lot of the times it's all about finding your demographic and I'm a student well no I'm, I'm actually a human and I don't care about someone from Eastern Europe <laughs> coming and take, you know, taking a job it should be more about us looking at issues uh, more uh, like sort of holistically you know and trying to actually deal with things with the causing factors I don't know I mean everyone's got their own opinion I just don't really see how you know you talk about growth GDP or what's that to me what about the fact that the UK and the US, probably some of the most westernised countries in the world, have the worst mental health issues in the world. There is a reason for that. And I don't think we deal with those issues enough, and that is why I'm disillusioned with politics. Yeah, just come back on that and just say, uh, I, I can't speak for everybody else, I'm sure they, they might uh, say something else, but. So, you know, my experience as having been recently elected as a politician is that it's actually incredibly hard to get media coverage mm. for the day-to-day -day work that you're doing. I talked earlier about the committee work that I do at the European Union and by the way that would be my question to you is uh, your views on our European Union membership. But uh, the, the you know, I, I can't get anything out or I, I find it really hard to get things out there about the work that's being doing, done in the committees I'm in at a European Union level on precisely your point about the energy, you know, renewable energies, technologies, possibilities, opportunities and you know, what is being delivered at that yeah. end because the media love PMQs. They love to see us beating each other up rather than actually seeing, and you know, politics is much more collegiate, as a, you know, we work together much more at a European Union level as well. So you know, again, that denies its newsworthiness because it doesn't have that quote unquote punch and Judy element. But most people I know, actually, to be fair, regardless of the po political affiliation, most people I know who have gone into politics have gone into politics because they do want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. They do want to change the world and they do want to you know, improve society. We have very different starting points and you know, the directions of travel about how we change society. But you know, we actually do fervently believe we're trying to do the right thing to Absolutely. make the world better. But isn't that the point that you think about issues and you take different ways of doing that change but again you're talking about renewable energy but renewable energy is logical if 
you work in a system that looks at keeping things sustainable and circular, whereas in a system where things where profit is all to do with scarcity, there's nothing profitable about I renewable energy. So it's like looking at these smaller issues when really they're the result of much far reaching you know, higher up things. So I'm not saying you can necessarily come in, everyone's got to find their scope, everyone's got to come in and work a certain angle, but it just seems to me best. like most, like today all I've listened to is people name call and so bounce any around any about issues. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> we'll, hear, we'll hear from Adrian. We'll hear yeah, from that'd be great. Well, there is an issue about the punch and Judy nature of politics, and frankly most people in the country are sick of it. Um, so there is an issue with politicians saying I'm better than you or holier than thou. Actually, politicians are typically caring and serving their communities and they're spending time away from their loved ones and their families doing other things that they like to serve in the way that they think best. The challenge is that they're not representing values in the way that they behave in the sense that when I was elected as a Camden councillor I spent four years in the chamber never speaking above anyone else while they were speaking in the chamber despite provocation and it was quite a shock to me when I came into the chamber and all the others were shouting at each other while they were talking. So there is a chance to bring different values into not just policies, but the way we behave. And that's what I'm doing as I develop the Green Party here. Well, the gentleman there has had his hand up for a little while, so. OK, well, the reason I think people become disillusioned, or certainly I do a bit, is because none of the parties are facing this, this hard truth of the deficit fully. I mean, yeah, we've cut the deficit in half, and the, that's great, but we need to eliminate it. And the, the hard truth behind that is we need further spending cuts, and we need to really um, make the economy much leaner and make the public sector much leaner. Otherwise, we're just going to go down and down and down. Our debt is going to keep going up, and we're not, I don't think we're going to get anywhere good in the future. And, and the, the way to do that is, you know, stop sending so much money to the EU and abroad, and you know, um, and these in-work benefits that Labour introduced, just a total waste of money. Why you should get a benefit in work? Why don't? Why not reduce people's taxes and then have them spending the economy? Because they're just this binge spending. It's ridiculous. David, can I set a homework question? Why is it that since this government came in, the national debt? There's a difference, of course, between the deficit is the overspend each year. Uh, why is the debt has doubled? when they have done their best to cut it back and apparently everybody's claiming, uh, complaining about the savage cuts. And this is a genuine question because I've Googled it and I can't find the answer. Something must be buried in the national spending that we're, st we're stuck with. And Nigel Farage suggested that there may be 300 million, and I think he's probably right, 300 million unnecessarily being spent on the public-private finance initiatives to build hospitals that Labour saddled us with. Something's, something's there that can't be controlled. And that's a concern to you guys because it's your future national debt. Well, they've sort of dragged everyone in the welfare net, haven't they, the last couple of years? I don't think it's a, no, it's not, it's, this must be something else. Oh, right, you so mean? It's, uh, and, and it's a genuine question. Uh, and well, it might, it might be sensible to research it on Google, etc. And you can email me the answer. Okay. I've, um, I've actually, I'm quite glad you asked that, because I've uh, asked, he knows the answer. I've asked Connor, I've asked Liam Fox, I've asked Michael Gove, um, I asked Nick Clegg, I've asked a lot of people this question. And every single one of them have given the same answer. I made a deliberate point of making sure I knew what these answers were. Was it the party line or was it individual opinions? Apparently it was the party line. But we looked, I looked at it, and the, the second largest bill being paid by the government is um, servicing our debt. Interest payments on the hundreds of billions of pounds that we've borrowed. But it's just looking at it that from a perspective of an ordinary human being, not a government, if you can't afford your rent, do you go to the bank and borrow uh, 2.6 billion? Or do you think, probably get another job or maybe move somewhere where the rent's a little bit lower? You don't think, I can't afford my food shopping this year, I think I'm just going to borrow another 10,000. But governments do. It's absurd that governments are in power for five years then they go right not our problem anymore just hand the debt on to someone else that's where the deficit's increasing because every year we're paying more and more and more in debt interest which previous political parties not name calling just previous political parties that are not conservative or liberal democrat have left us that's the debt legacy that was left behind to us by another party and we're now having to pay it off which means that and i don't mean we as in the conservatives i mean we having to pay this off 
because another party recklessly spent our money. That's where this increase is coming from. It's servicing our debt payments. Hardly, but it can't be the whole lot. It's not enough. The annual debt interest isn't enough to have pushed it up by that much. There must be something that the government can't control, otherwise it presumably would have done so. I believe the annual debt interest is about £364 billion. No, it's about 50. You, you, make a really, you make a really good point, but you undermine it by getting a really fundamental fact wrong. Um, debt interest every year is not the second highest item of government expenditure. It's not ahead of, it's not just behind the National Health Service or, or, or defence or welfare, which are, are amongst the, the biggest. The, the point you make is a good one, though. And, you know, sometimes I get really frustrated with the debate in contemporary politics. I can say this as a backbencher. So I, I, have a, I resigned from a ridiculous little job I had as a parliamentary <laughs> private secretary to leave the government. So I can really be a bit more open about this. The difference between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in our spending commitments in the next parliament are actually pretty small. And we exaggerate that to create difference. Um, and actually, I think it's a, bit, it's a bit unfair on the electorate to do that. We need to have a really candid conversation in this country about what it is that the public expect of the state and how much tax we need to levy on the citizens, because tax is money that we take off people who earn incomes and bring in to the state and spend. It is not government money. Too often politicians talk about government money. Government has no money. Government only has the money it takes off the working population in this country. It is true that the coalition government has doubled the national debt. We've added more to the national debt in the first three years that we were in than Labour added in the 13 years than they were in. Now, that's not the impression you would get by listening to the debate on the airwaves. And if you say that as a politician, the media would write that up as a gaffe. Conor Burns, Conservative MP, issues major gaffe, makes major gaffe. The major gaffe is telling the truth. And if the politicians can't tell the public the truth, how on earth can we have a rationed and reasoned debate about how we bring that, firstly, the deficit down, and the point is absolutely right that was made at the end here. The deficit is not the same thing as the debt. The deficit is the gap between what government is spending over and above what it's bringing in in tax revenue each year. The debt is the amount we are borrowing, which is soaring. And all politicians need to get a grip on this for one group's sake above all, and that is the young people in this room and throughout this country. Because if we fail to do it, you will have to. So if you say your point, then we must throw it open. Immediately so follow on, on from there. The amount, the pot of money that the, the government has to spend at the moment, um, or the amount of spending, is about 730 billion a year. That's what it is, 730 billion. We only make about 650 billion through taxes and, and, and all the other things. So there's a gap there, and that's the deficit that Connor spoke about. So we have to pay that back each year, and it, it is reducing. That's the deficit. That's the amount of money that we borrow each year, and it is sliding down. That's getting right. But because over a series of years that deficit, we've not been able to make, make, make ends meet, has added up, and that's what you call the debt. So that is the trouble. And then the debt, of course, you have to borrow from banks in order to, 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 to be allowed to have a debt, just as you borrow from a bank if you had an overdraft. And that uh, interest on that debt is about £53 billion pounds a year. So £53 billion just to borrow money just to pay for the, for, for, for the ability to be able to borrow money. And that's the challenge we pay. And you know, your example, oh, cut, you know, do more cuts. But you've heard other examples here to say, no, actually, we want tuition fees to be paid for. And that is the, the test of any government as to how they actually indeed spend that money. That's the difficulties that, of power, of the, the tough decision. Let me, if I can finish. I want to come back to the, the, the PMQ's point, because this is very important. Prime Minister's questions, which does seem uh, you know, very gladiatorial. It is only you know, a half percent of the work that goes on, and a not very relevant half in that case. And yet it is the yardstick from every, which everybody judges how Parliament is actually doing. Connor sits on a very important committee, um, uh, the Culture, Media and Sport Committee, that looks at all sorts of things. The rollout of broadband wireless, for example, they can speak about all sorts of important things. Media, about how we punch above our weight on, in cultural matters uh, on the international scene. <coughs> that is all backed by government. Yesterday I did a debate on Ukraine uh, and Russia and the sanctions that we're imposing on Russia because of what they're doing. And we also discussed the fact that they're now flying Russian aircraft, bombers, mm -hmm. just off Bournemouth mm -hmm. coast. That didn't even get a mention in the press, didn't, or a little, a little bit locally, yeah, yeah. but not as much as all these other things because the press gallery is full of, of when Prime Minister's questions. And I think the worry that I have, or that I think the whole, I hope the, pan the panel would share, 
is that we all want everybody to pay taxes, to get a job to be able to pay taxes you know, in your life, and to obey the law. They're the two things that any government wants everybody to actually do. There is a third element that I personally would want everybody to do, and that's do something which isn't for yourself. Do something for your community. Now, it could be standing as an MP, or it could be doing something in your local community or in your school or something, but something which is part of being the world that we're with, the society. And my worry is that where, when people watch Prime Minister's questions, how many of you would be inspired to want to be a, an MP? I, may, I, may I ask? Put your hand up if you would inspire to become a Member of Parliament in the audience now. Please put your hand up. Me, you. Okay, yeah. uh, and that, that is, is sad indictment on the fact that we don't want, we are actually putting people off from to participating in this important decision-making process. And I don't quite know what the answer is for that, to actually imp improve that. But the more that we have this knockabout, the more we have the gladiatorial exchange, the more people are put off from even wanting to step forward and wanting to sort of change the world that they're in. Well, we'll hear from the gentleman at the back because he's had his hand up for a while, and then we'll go to the lady over there. I, I think a great source of cynicism amongst particularly our generation is that there's no ideological struggle. Once the glorious victory of capitalism of the Cold War, hurrah, um, there's a general consensus over we all like the social liberal state, sorry, the democratic states. We like a degree of free market economics. And because of that, there's no institutional imagination. When we see the prime minister's debates, by the way, I like the shouting, the yelling. I find it all very thrilling. Um, <laughs> there's really just a bunch of fore over how we're balancing the books. So how are we meant to be enthused over that? We're, 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 we're here, the lady up there, and you can reply to whatever you like. So I just wanted to add on the point about building a conversation, and especially as we're all, uh, like with the young audience today, um, I think it's very clear that there's an outdated view that we're apathetic about politics, and I think that we are all, we're here and we're all really interested, and it's a confusing message that's been given. So I think what we want to say is in terms of engagement, I think it's stupid to think that just creating a Twitter account and writing a tweet is going to engage a whole audience. That's not what it is, but there's so many different platforms today that you can engage with us on in different ways. And I think that's what we want, but it's not our responsibility because I think lots of people don't care enough about it at the moment. And I think it's your responsibility to go out there and get not only the policies in place, but also just your voice in place that you can engage with us on all these different levels. And we're willing to, we're willing to listen, but it, you need to go out there and just, it's not just on TV, but it's on all these different ways from new media where you can contact us and get, get our voices heard. And then through then, I think we all will be able to engage a lot more with you because we're not able to just watch TV and listen to a debate and understand exactly what's going on because it's confusing. Because you've not spoken too much. Oh, okay. I can, I, <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who um, did hear I, I, I did. And actually, I think today is a demonstration of how we, you know, how that works, if you like, and the fact that you've got two MPs and an MEP and representatives from other parties as well. And that there are so many of you here shows that there's a kind of willingness on both sides that we're feeling towards trying to, to make that engagement work. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very pleased that it, it has today and you know, may more of these events happen. Uh, but it is, yeah, we, we, we all try and feel our way through social media and other means and obviously traditional media as well as doing events like today. I did just want to come back on you know, some of the points that were made earlier as well and the, the, the de deficit, the, the issue around that and one of the reasons that the government has failed to meet the targets that uh, Osborne very publicly set on these is the lack of tax take. Uh, and this has been something that I think has been, uh, you know, is a very serious issue around this election as well, is wages and the people, whether people are or aren't actually benefiting from uh, the economy. Because as I said earlier about the, the reduction in the level of uh, hourly pay, the point that was also made about zero hours contracts and the restructuring of our economy. And I think that is a hugely important issue. And it is, it demonstrates that out of that conversation of sort of statistics, there are very real issues underneath that that have to have political solutions and that we have to work towards as well. Okay, David Ross. Um, engagement with the electorate is a, a key part of my campaign because one of my frustrations is that MP websites really look like a gate and you don't get past that gate. 
um, I created a forum. I was amazed how easy it was. £20 for a whole year to, to download the software, stick it on your website, and you've got a forum. It's wonderful. I thought I was going to have to ask, ask a Bournemouth University student to do it for me. I managed it myself. Um, I believe that an MP should be constantly in touch with the electorate and asking their advice and giving them information, such as what's coming up next week in Parliament and also uh, what are your views on it. If you're a retired major and we're going to vote um, on going to war, I'd like to hear your views. Perhaps we wouldn't have gone into Afghanistan if the retired military and historians had been listened to. We've got a few minutes left. Does anyone in the audience have any points to raise? Gentleman here. I just want to pick up on what that young lady was saying. It's a case where the national headquarters of the national parties need to communicate better with the local councillors. Your local councillors are the guys on the ground. That's the grassroots level. They know what's going on locally. They know what's going on in, the, in, these, in these guys' areas because they're there with them. They live with them 24-7. They're there. They know what's going on. So there needs to be better communication from the HQ down to your guys on the ground so you can survey your message right through the kind of chain of command, so to speak. Because we're not in, most of the time we, we don't pay attention too much to the national. We want to know what's going on locally because that will impa impact us straight away, probably the next day and so forth. So you need to work better with the local councils and local Sorry to have to break up here, but that is all the time we have now. Uh, thank you for everyone in the audience that came today and thank you to our panel for coming as well.